trying to think of how many pressure jokes I'm going to make today, but anyways. All right, here we go. Welcome to episode 128 of the Canadian Prepper Podcast, recorded August 15th, 2021. Eric and Alan bailed because they couldn't talk about carbon monoxide or ham radio tonight, and they just don't like the listeners that much, I guess. So here we are. My name is Ian. I live on Vancouver Island. I'm a student preparedness, target shooter, and small-scale hobby farmer. I'm Jeff. I'm based in central Ontario. I'm a target shooter, soon-to-be ham radio operator, and general overall handyman. I'm Carmen. I'm based in BC. I'm a micro homesteader, wife, personal trainer, and general domestic guru. And I love sharing my knowledge with others from canning to throwing an axe. Want to help support the show and keep the Canadian Pepper podcast on the air? Buy some swag. We have the Canadian Pepper podcast t-shirt and the tactical Velcro patch at www.prepperpodcast.ca. All proceeds help to keep the lights on and the backup generator fueled. And if you're enjoying the show, please take a few minutes and like us on Facebook, submit a review for iTunes. We also want your feedback, good or bad. And even if there's a topic you want us to cover, let us know. You can email us at feedback at proper, prepperpodcast.ca. All right. First of all, I'm going to go back to the throwing the axe thing. <laughs> that sounds like another whole episode to itself right there. Like, I think we'd uh, we're have to revisit that one one day. Anyways, uh, we have some contents under pressure for you this evening. Uh, we're going to start off with some preparedness-related news. We're going to let you know what we did for preps this week. And then we're going to get into the main topic, which is uh, pressure canning part two. So news time. So I've got a couple of uh, issues here, or things kind of to bring up. And uh, one of them is... Um, it looks like an ambiguous website, but it's not. I did some digging. So basically, uh, with the drought that's going on out west, one of the uh, southern Manitoba ski resorts has already said, we're not opening next year. Our retention ponds are at like 30% what they're supposed to be. And even if we get tons and tons and tons of rain, we're not going to have enough water and we're not even going to we're not even going to be able to open. So um, that's just... Kind of, I guess, the way things are now out west with the drought and the heat and the fires and everything. So um, there was another uh, ongoing issue again of uh, this is from uh, CNBC and it was a cryptocurrency hack. Uh, basically, hackers uh, broke into a cryptocurrency network. They stole six hundred million dollars. And, wow. and but That's here's the, the best part. They said in good faith to show you that we're not really really bad people we'll give you 300 million of that 600 million back so they're really not good people because they stole 300 million but they want to think they're good people so um so, so it's kind of like the government with, it's like the government when they take your income tax and they give you some back at the end of the year just to show you what good people they are and yeah oh, i was yeah. gonna say that yeah yeah that's okay. basically it oh, that's um, and the last one i've i've got is uh from the financial post and they're basically talking like anything else. Uh, natural gas prices mm -hmm. are surging. Uh, they've gone up a thousand percent in the last year and a half. And it looks like they're going to continue to go up. So uh, just like anything else, the cost of heating your home and doing everything else is going through the roof. Wow. Yeah. That's it's amazing how they can call that ski resort right off the bat before the first snow has even fallen, eh? Yeah, it. Uh, mm -hmm. But I mean, if you're, you know, when I, when I read in the other website there, they they basically said it takes several million liters of water to make snow and and get them, mm -hmm. and um, it's a phenomenal amount of money to just start the snow guns. I mean, you've got you've got to hire the staff and you've got to get the machines going and. It's not just water, it's air and it's, it's running the machines. And they said it's into the, it's into the hundreds of thousands of dollars just to turn the machines on with a, with no guarantee that they may not get more than a couple of weeks out of the season. So oh, they're just not worth it. Their hands and running. Huh, that's amazing. Yeah. I mean, like, I guess natural gas was always the go-to thing with Alberta too. Like they used to have like, well, they have like hundreds of years worth of natural gas in the ground, but I guess supply and demand right now. And yeah. Who knows? Hmm. Yeah, yeah, and with, with the push on to which is which is legitimate, the push on to get rid of coal and everything else, it's everything's going to natural gas. And so yeah. Sounds like we need to build a wood gas fire in the backyard. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> All right, I got a couple of uh, news articles. 
Uh, first one is uh, Alberta is not relaxing their COVID restrictions after all. They had planned to, I guess, open things up tomorrow. Uh, no, really? And look, lo and behold, you'd be shocked. Yes, the government decided to to hang on to their little power trip a little Shut longer. Down. So, <laughs> yeah. So, uh, unfortunately, Alberta's while it has reduced a lot of their stuff, they're still re requiring masks on like taxis and buses and a bunch of other stuff in public buildings and stuff. So, yeah, it's going to stay until late September at the very earliest. So, mm. yay. Um, and another one, uh, Ningbo, China, which is uh, mm. the world's third largest port, uh, as well as the largest one in China. They shut it down. Yeah, they shut it down surprisingly yeah. over one COVID case. More like one million, maybe. <laughs> <laughs> well, you got to wonder, so is it state propaganda from China that's saying they've only got one COVID mm. case? Is it, uh, are they messing with international trade and trying to like, you know, cause some, some failures uh, with their, their oh, of course. You know, quote unquote enemies or what is going on? But clearly some, some tomfoolery mm. is happening here. So I don't know what's going on, but I put an article from the uh, BBC and one from fortune uh, regarding this, because that is obviously one case would not be a legitimate reason to shut down like one of the world's largest ports. Right. Mm -mm. Anyway. Oh, there's, there's, a lot more to it, but oh yeah, we probably won't oh, yeah. know for twenty years, but we'll figure it out eventually. Yeah. Yep. Um, last one I had was just the. Uh, did you guys hear about the protest in Montreal that was going on? No. Well, you I wouldn't didn't. hear it from mainstream media, but yeah, I've I've heard about it. Yep. Yeah. So I put two articles in. The first one was from I guess this. It's listed second, anyways, from CBC, and it uh, basically said that yeah, they had a uh, Quebec vaccination passport. Uh, protest going on in Montreal, but they said, don't worry, it's only a couple dozen people. It's no big deal. They're just a fringed bunch of lunatics. Uh, then he, I put the link from the Facebook in there, and I'm not on Facebook, but my, my buddy sent me the video, and it shows mm -hmm. thousands of people downtown, like 10,000 oh. plus. And so, obviously, it was uh, a fairly substantial protest, and uh, obviously not everybody's happy with that idea that's coming coming into play here. Oh, yeah. Well, the last the last time there was, uh, there was one in Toronto, same thing the mainstream media was you know, a handful of, and, and, you know, a, a couple of thousand and same thing, people that were there were sending me pictures and it was blocks and blocks of nothing but people crowded in. And of course, if that's supposed to be a, a super spreader event, you would have thought the hospitals would have been jam packed by now. And no doubt that there's a few cases, but it's, it's not. Yeah. yeah. And, and of course the mainstream media won't cover, won't say a single word about it. No, no, they didn't think Lollapalooza was a spreader event, and they didn't think Obama's birthday was. But I guess uh, they were worried about Sturgis bikes rally, bike rally down in uh, the Dakotas there being a super spreader event. But it's only what they pick and choose to to be a problem, I guess. Yeah, well, it, I mean, it's no different than I, I think I mentioned this a couple of podcasts ago. The um, the Calgary Stampede. Oh, it's mm -hmm. going to be a super spreader event. Oh, look out, look out, look out. So far, they've been able to link back a hundred and thirty two cases out of five hundred and twenty five thousand people that attended so <laughs> but of course mainstream media again they're not going to uh they're not going to talk about that no all right no. So hopefully hopefully our stream doesn't get cut off now that we've mentioned the magic words yeah <laughs> 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 uh, okay so i guess uh moving on we should probably talk about uh, a couple of corrections from the last episode so scott put some uh, notes in here i just wanted to clarify mm -hmm. a couple things uh, so regarding wood big acidifiers, it occurred to him that uh, listening to the last podcast over after we were talking about it, we never really described what the actual gasifier looks like. And so we talked more about the chemistry and everything else. But of course, this being radio, um, he wanted to clarify that when you build a wood gasifier, there's basically two equivalent of like four foot tall, 100 pound propane tanks as the main bodies of the device. One, one side has the wood chunks uh, going in it. and It's called the reaction chamber. And then the other one uh, goes through the cooling tubes and then into the second one, which does basically the filtration. And then after the filtration section, it goes, obviously turns into the, the gas that's usable, right? Um, so he just wants to make sure that the listeners are aware of that. And if you have any more questions, of course, go to the YouTube channel we mentioned last week, and I'm sure it'll be clarified more. So uh, what we've done lately for preps, Jeff? Uh, I just got back. Um, I was down at my mom's But anyways, I just bought a, a fairly large, they call them... Um, job boxes they're they're basically uh, a large metal box that you take to a job site and put all your tools and do all that in it mm -hmm. um and that's going to be my next uh, faraday project it's going to be big enough to put in my generator um mm -hmm. you know an inverter charge controllers probably a couple of smaller solar panels are all going to be able to nicely fit inside this box it's not that heavy of course it will be once i fill it 
but um, I'll put I'll put wheels on it, and that's going to be my uh, that's my next project, and I'm hoping to get that going within the next uh, probably month or so that I'll have that uh, going. Right on. Um, as for myself, I made the final switch. We uh, switched from uh, a gas sto or electric stove to gas. So just in terms of the natural gas increases, I guess. No. <laughs> <laughs> we uh, we're running our stove off. <laughs> yeah, we're running our stove off of propane, so it's good. So we had a, a licensed gas feeder come in and, and run the lines and, and get it all set up, and uh, we got it, uh, plugged in, worked fine, except for one burner. The sparkler unit doesn't work, of course. So now we're under a warranty claim. But anyways, uh, the good news is that we have a, a, a stove that works in power outages. We'll talk about that later because one listener asked me about that. And then um, let's see here, I did a range trip where I miraculously decided to scope in the hunting rifle for the season, and my scope rings busted one of them so oh. that's useless so it's, it's so funny because they, they were already pre-torqued from last year and everything else and all of a sudden a couple shots and the front end of the scope kind of went loose so i was like well that's not good at all so i guess i have a trip to cabela's in my future here to sort that out i uh, mm -hmm. did a couple cgn deals of course uh interesting enough i had an inspiration the island mentor here on on the, just down the road he uh, decided to tell me about uh keeping my car battery charged up because I had a slow leak in the in one of our cars, and so he says, "Well, just put this solar panel on the back of the car and hook it directly into one of the, the lines that's always hot." And sure enough, so I managed to get a solar battery uh, charger like solar uh, installed in the back of the car just to keep the battery from going dead while we're not using it for a week. Because if you don't basically start the car for more than a week, it just it's dead. So dead, dead. Uh, yeah. So that, that helps. Um, then other than that, the only thing left for us uh, this week is we did started doing the wild Himalayan blackberry harvest which is an ongoing thing every time about this middle of August kind of happens and mm -hmm. hopefully we'll make some jam out of it. Nice. I, I've seen some of those solar charges you're talking about. They, the one I seen was maybe about 18 inches long, maybe six inches wide. And it had four suction, one suction cup on each corner. And you just stuck it on your front window and you plugged it into your cigarette lighter and it would keep your battery charged when you're, if your car was sitting for a long period of time. Yeah, and see, this is uh, about double that size, and it's uh, it's hardwired back into the actual wires, wiring harnesses in the back of the car, um, and that way you don't have to like type your cigarette later or anything else. It's just kind of unobtrusive in the back uh, back window type of thing. Oh, so, perfect. Okay. <laughs> yeah, no, so it, uh, it worked out fairly well. So, Carmen. Well, I signed up for my pal about four months ago, <laughs> and it's finally coming to fruition this next week. So I'm really happy to be taking that course finally. Uh, I'm excited to finally get out, get my license and actually go down to the range and do some stuff and hopefully some hunting in the future. Uh, our ham radio desk is now downstairs in the basement, and we're getting that set up this weekend, actually. So that's the next thing after the podcast here is getting all the wires adjusted. And of course, I've been canning like a mad hatter with the garden stuff, getting everything put away from the season. I finished off my cucumbers finally, ripped out those plants, and I got some space for my garlic to go in come November. So I'm basically ready to go for the season, except for my potatoes have to get harvested still. That's about nice. it. That's awesome. Mm -hmm. Um, yeah, interesting. I think the, the licensing was, I guess the processing of the licenses was uh, delayed for quite a while because of COVID. I think they're starting to actually yeah. get them done now because for a while there people were waiting like eight months to get their licenses back in the mail. and It was a little crazy, but supposedly because yeah, of a broken printer or something. You told me it's about six weeks now after I take my course, I'll finally probably get my registration and then I can go down and yeah, I've my, been go get my boomstick. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. I, I've, I've got my pal and I was signed up uh, at the local gun club. Eric uh, got me in at the local gun club here and I was two weeks from my inter the, the, the gun club having its own inter course and safety course and whatever. And I was two weeks away when the first COVID thing hit and there's been nothing since. So I've been sitting for 18 months waiting for. Oh, so apparently they said they're going to try and start opening up again in the next couple of weeks. So hopefully I'll hear something and I can, I can, like you say, finally get out and start hammering the boomstick. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Patrick little, the uh, listener, he says, uh, I also enjoy hearing what you guys do for preps. I feel chatty. So I'll join in. Just got my fishing license and bought enough tackle to get started. Yeah. Yeah, I love fishing. I'm actually going on a, a fishing uh, trip, me and Eric and a bunch of his buddies in uh, three weeks. I believe we're going away for the weekend. So yeah, it's uh it's a good time. Mm -hmm. Actually There's... just oh go ahead. <laughs> oh sorry, I was gonna say they're uh, just below us here. Well, you know the area, Carmen, but the uh mm -hmm. 
uh, just below where I live here, there's the, the local bay actually has a bunch of uh, invasive clams, manila clams in them. And normally you only harvest those in months that, you know, don't, uh, that have an R in them type of thing. And uh, so June, July, and August, generally people don't. And yet I've seen tons of tourists in the last couple of days get, must have had their saltwater license and go out and start harvesting these things. They must be soft and squishy right now, but Ew. yeah. Anyway. No. <laughs> um, yeah no i uh, before we get to go in here too uh a couple guys mm -hmm. were asking some canning questions already don't worry guys we've got those questions mm -hmm. covered uh, like phil your question there will be covered here in about 20 minutes or so and uh, we'll get a couple other ones going here oh yeah um, yeah that's yeah, actually it's pretty Hopefully busy here. i have all the answers <laughs> yeah no it's good actually um uh, actually we might as well move right into the main topic because of that because uh we should probably talk about why we're talking about this uh mm -hmm. it turns out canning and Kenning and preserving was our actually most downloaded episode ever. So this is, yeah, hopefully going to be just as well. And obviously judging by the comments, we got a lot of feedback already. Um, why are we talking about this again? Because I'm not an expert. Uh, Eric wasn't either. And uh, I've got to hold a Carmen here through a third party. It was fantastic. And uh, so because she's grossly uh, more qualified than we are. So <laughs> that I get you on this time to talk about us for sure. Um, so yeah, let's, let's start off right with the beginning. I made a mistake last time of just referring to everything as canning, but mm -hmm. a couple of listeners took me literally. What is this between? <laughs> yeah. So like, we're not actually talking about cans. We're talking about like mostly like glass jars, but can you clarify the difference between canning, jarring and bottling? Uh, canning is the process of preserving foods from various forms for later consumption, obviously, um, sealed into jars. It's usually through a water bath or through pressure canning itself, which is a pressurized water bath, basically. And then jarring can include wet or dry foods that is sealed into a jar. There's no real cat category on that. And then bottling is like your wines, your bottles, your soda pops, things like that. Awesome. Well, first of all, I guess we should uh, talk a uh, little bit about yourself as, for, as well. Oh, <laughs> I'm a little nervous, but it's all good. No, we got um, time. I'm relatively new to the prepper mindset. Um, I kind of grew up in a family that was more self-sufficient. We had big gardens in the backyard. We canned, we harvested things, we dehydrated things on the side. Um, hunting and gardening, I remember going to my papa's place and having the moose hanging in the garage and chopping that up. And, uh, oh, a little girl shouldn't be in here kind of a thing, but I'm like, ooh. <laughs> uh, canning and preserving and bringing things to the table has always been part of my background in growing up. And uh, my mother's and aunts and my Oma, we'd all gather the vegetables in the gardens and bring them in. And you'd be sitting there shelling peas on the patio kind of a thing. It's very old school, but at the same time, it's just how I grew up. And then I, of course, left that in my 20s and 30s and didn't really pay attention to it because it's, you know, society in the modern world. <laughs> and then I kind of came back to it all of a sudden. I was like, you know, I miss doing this. I miss having real food on my table. And now I have almost a thousand jars in my collection and uh, it's still growing. I want to get at least 2,000 some days. So I can have a full larder for a full year and not I even have to go to the grocery store, maybe. <laughs> that would be <laughs> awesome. Yeah. I could, That'd yeah. be awesome if I could, but yeah, it'd be hard. <laughs> Yeah, actually, we were laughing because one of my coworkers was mentioning that his brother-in-law has four thousand pounds of rice in the basement, and I was like, "Oh, oh, that sounds awesome!" And meanwhile, he's 4, like, "Four thousand. Yeah, I was like, "That seems a little extreme." He's like, uh, "I'm meanwhile, I'm thinking this. That sounds awesome." That's a whole bedroom. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that was awesome. How many pails is that? I'm just curious. Well, I'm thinking if, if you got twenty-five pounds of rice and uh, per mm -hmm. bag, and he got four thousand pounds of rice, what's so one hundred and sixty bags? Ooh. Jeez. And he's got to put them in, you know, buckets or mylar or something like you. Well, in the Asian countries, they just literally have a pile in a shed and it's like an eight foot high pile for the year kind of a thing. They just pile it in there and it's in a shed. So. Yeah. But, I mean, uh, I guess you got to worry about like uh, uh, rodents or whatever, too. But mm -hmm. I, don't Oof, I don't know. <laughs> cool. Uh, oh, pardon? Did we lose well, Ian? We, yeah, we lost him. So I'll, I think I'll we lost of, Ian. <laughs> I kind of stepped in to help a little bit. So, so basically, the question uh, was, what got you into preparedness? So, into the canning, and I know you talked about what you used to do back when you were younger. Mm -hmm. So, what kind of got you uh, into the process? It was more of knowing what was coming up in the world. It was just actually just before the whole COVID thing hit. I finally started to get back into it. Bought my first jars. Bought my first pressure canner started looking into it. And then of course COVID hit and I was just like, whoa, whoa, this is a little more serious than I thought. Like I'm locked in my house for weeks on end. And I, 
was just remembered when I was a kid, we would go to the grocery store maybe once a month. So it was like, I got to get back to that kind of a feeling. And then that just started this whole mindset of learning more about the preparedness community and then realizing I've been doing it all along. <laughs> and then uh, be like, oh, I'm already part of this. I didn't even realize it. So going, just going back to things and finding out what was going on. And then, of course, with the jar and the lid shortage that happened about mid-2020 there and everything else that was going on, I'm kind of glad that I purchased so much at the beginning. I went a little overboard, according to my husband. So, But I'm kind of glad I did. It's all locked away now, and I've got it for the future. And, uh, yeah, it's kind of kind of fell into it, I guess, would be the word for it. Awesome. Are you guys, uh, can you hear me now? Oh, we yeah, hear you now. Oh, yay, I'm back. <laughs> all right. Well, maybe not yeehaw, but well, you could just take for us fine. That's, that's all good with me. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, it's, it sounds like, yeah, obviously, you got a solid background on all this. Uh, can you tell us the difference between uh, water bath and like regular pressure canning? Uh, water like bath is basically when you're boiling your jars that you've prepared, like pickles, your tomato paste, things like that, high acid foods. Um, this only gets to up to about 100 or 212 degrees Fahrenheit, which is the boiling water, 100 degrees Celsius. And that boiling temperature, the natural acid that's in there, plus the boiling temperature at a certain amount of time kills the bacteria mostly in a, in a water bath canner. In a pressure canner, you're killing everything. The temperature is getting up to about 250 degrees Fahrenheit, so a lot hotter. It's killing off our friends, botulism and E. coli, because <laughs> we don't want them to be our friends. We want to get rid of them. And it's preserving it and sealing the jar, especially for meats and low acid vegetables like potatoes. We want to make sure that we've cooked it thoroughly all the way through so that it's safe to eat later, basically. So there's a huge difference there between water bath canning and pressure canning and just in temperature and what you're killing in the process to preserve the food. So that's the main difference is the death rate. <laughs> and then the second difference is what foods you can have in a water bath canner compared to a pressure canner. So the pressure canner, basically everything, meat, potatoes, vegetables, almost everything can be in there, except for the occasional things like ham and preserved meats that's already been done. So like your summer sausages and stuff like that, it's already been preserved in a way so that texture has changed that process has changed for it so you really don't want to preserve it more do you get what i mean like it's just going to reprocess it and it's not the texture is not there it's not it's not too nice there and then with water bath kind it's all your acids your fruit your tomatoes um a lot of things like apple pie filling cherry pie filling which is one of my favorites um those can all be water bath and of course your pickles which are lots of fun awesome yeah. Uh, can you tell us the difference between actual canning with metal tins? Uh, is it worth it or not? Or can you have you ever done that before? Uh, people used to do it quite a bit back when it was really cheap to do. And now it's expensive, expensive. You think jars are expensive, the whole tinning operations, things like that. You're talking a couple of thousand just to get set up. And that's before you even get your food and your lids for it. And on top of that, we have a shortage right now in tin in the world and aluminum in the world for the cans to start with. And in fact, I think it was just a month ago in Italy, they were talking about a shortage of the canning cans for tomatoes, for the Italian tomatoes. So that's something to think about for the go, putting in your larder right now, because next year there ain't going to be so many and it's going to be pretty expensive. Um, it's going to be, uh, the shortage is going to be coming through the lineup pretty soon on that one because they just literally don't have the tin and the aluminum to do it. So it's not in the supply chain anymore. So, uh, fancy tomatoes, get them now while you can, <laughs> but as to doing it at home, it is quite a process. Um, and a lot of people say it's really not worth it because you're just doing the same thing. You're taking these little cans and you're putting into your pressure canner. And at the commercial level, it gets up to such a higher heat and the higher, bigger pressure canners that. Yes, they can do noodles. They can do all those other stuff in there, but it's kind of too much. Over, it's like overkill. It's a really overkill compared to like just using your jars and your lids that you can get anywhere, like your local Canadian Tire. Um, getting those supplies is really hard these days. I really don't think it's worth it, honestly. It's kind of silly at this point to even think about it. Yeah, I, I heard a couple of the American uh, prepper channels were mentioning using uh, like the actual number 10 cans and making their own cans and stuff. That seems a little extreme to me, too. So, yeah, it's a little overboard. <laughs> going <laughs> too far there. <laughs> it's like, no, I can just go get my jar at the Canadian Tire and I'm good. You know? <laughs> uh, one thing we didn't cover last episode, too, was the uh, glass lids, like actual 
purpose of those or if that's just older technology or, or what can you tell us about using glass lids versus it's metal? Literally the older technology, the same glass that the jar is built out of, they made a lid and they had a little uh, rubber seal that fit inside that ring around that ring. You've probably seen them on a couple of jars in the vintage stores and stuff like that. And that rubber seal would seal it just like it normally would on our current lids that we have with that very thin rubber seal attached to the metal. So it's the same technology, just that's older school. And now we have the nice aluminum lids with the rubber already attached and it's instant. There's no cracking. It just depends on how you would tighten your lids. It was all very fussy. Let's put it that way. And now it's a little more like just chink done and you're on your way into canning. So um, the rubber seals are still used for the um, permanent lids, which I do have a few of with the actual separate rubber seals. I haven't really experimented with them that much yet because um, I just got them. So I'm just starting to start playing with them this winter with some of my frozen vegetables and see how that goes. But a lot of people do have a lot of success with the uh, forever lids, the harvest, harvest guard and uh, tattler lids, I believe is the word for it. Yeah, the tattler lids. I was going to ask about those. I think mm -hmm. we had a listener comment uh, asking about those as well. If they recommend it, if you'd recommend them or not. Like, what do you, I do. What do you I've them? bought them myself. I just haven't played with them yet. Literally, I got the finally got them in the mail. I guess would be the word for it. There was a bit of a, a hiccup trying to get them these days. So, actually, this is something that came up as well. Uh, I don't think we covered really properly last show either. Uh, Freya is also asking, can you use this, the little metal lids more than once? Now, this is a huge debate in the canning world, in the canning rebel world, in the can like canning by the rules and canning rebels. <laughs> um, I would reuse them for like sealing away dry goods or pasta or something like that in a in a, just a jar like normal. Um, I wouldn't reuse the lids if I was pressure canning, especially. Or if I was just doing like some pickles that were going to go in my fridge anyways, I might reuse the lid for that. I personally don't think that seal has sealed on that jar to a point where it's the micro abrasions that are on that glass it connected with that glass in that way to seal it properly so you go and take that lid off and those that rubber has the imprint of that glass on it you know on a microscopic type level you would have to like cook these lids some people say just cook them extra put them in the oven etc once again it's just way more than you need to be doing <laughs> And even then you can't be hundred percent that it's going to seal properly and not only that, but seal for years. Maybe it'll seal for a month and then it'll pop in your, in your pantry and go bad. And you go in there and go, Ooh, what's that smell? It could be your reuse, you reused lid that's sprung on you basically. So I don't advise it. Um, the ball and the Bernardin and the health people really don't advise it. Um, it's just kind of a dangerous thing to do, especially when you're preserving expensive things like meat. It's really not worth it in my opinion. Yeah, a ten cent lid versus a, or maybe a fifty cent lid versus a, you know, well, a ten dollar like piece of meat, right? Sixty five cent lid these days, but <laughs> yeah, no, it used to be a ten cent lid, right? Mm -hmm. um, Free also mentions that she saw yeah, a couple pick up fifty or more cases from Canadian Tire <laughs> while waiting for a curbside pickup, so I guess they know what's up already as well. It's yeah. like, yeah, supply <laughs> runs happening. Right? Yeah, I got yeah. ten cases the other day. So. <laughs> well, actually, I, I, I so okay. Somebody else on here asked the question, and I, I know nothing about canning, so I, I don't. But they said, do you have experience using WEC, W-E-C-K jars? If so, what's your opinion of them? That is, from what I know, the European version of the Tatler lids. I have not had any experience with them. I have heard good things about them, but I haven't experimented with them at all. Hmm. Awesome. Uh, mm -hmm. Adrian asks, uh, how long would you say canned broth lasts if you uh, pressure can it? Uh, if it's pressure can, it's just like anything else. Um, you can go by the rule book, and the rule book says about up to two years. I have personally had broth that was 10 years old put into a soup and eaten, and it was fine. Oh, actually, that reminds me. We've got actually <laughs> some uh, some canned bear meat coming up on two years as well. Um, mm -hmm. I'm just wondering at this point, should we just consider it dog food or give it a try? Oh, eat it. Yeah, eat it. <laughs> No, I've had six-year-old chicken. So, yeah, no, as, as long as the seal's still there and everything's still solid, go ahead and crack her open and eat it. So, Awesome. Yeah, no, we were yeah. just debating that. We're like, hmm, what if it's dog food yet? But anyways, we'll yeah. uh, see what's the happening. rules say about two years, but, you know, if it's discolored in any way, if it's really, something's really changed compared to the other jars, then I would be, you know, when in doubt, throw it out is the phrase. 
Yeah. If you open it and it does not smell like you think it should smell, just throw it out. But yeah, I've had six year old chicken before. I've had, well, I've had jam that was 20 years old almost for my family. So, <laughs> well, there's so much sugar in that that pretty much lasts yeah, forever. Anyway, it was right? good. It was really good. So, awesome. so you would say on the average, it would be around two years to be safe. You, it could go yeah, more, but two years is, is, a. Uh, is a fair, well, hopefully fair you've had a harvest come and go for these things, or you've processed more meat from your farm or that kind of thing. Like you think about in the olden days, if they had a bad harvest the next year, they wanted to make sure they had enough for the year after to get to the next harvest. So two to three years is kind of the norm for most people rotating their pantry. Okay. So you kind of want to build up to the point where you have a year or two going kind of a thing in case you have a bad harvest of pickles the next year in case your tomatoes don't work the next year you want to kind of build it up as much as you can when you do have a good harvest sock it away and if it happens to be five years later when you break open that tomato sauce to have your spaghetti then so be it it's just the way the ball bounces sometimes but the average joe canner is about two to three years if they're if they're stocking up or through the winter and then they harvest the next year and can away for the winter again till the next harvest is available. So it kind of depends on how the person wants to do their own stocking and storage. Hmm. Awesome. Uh, Frey is also asking, what type of tomatoes did you grow? I did Amish paste this year, heritage breed. I did uh, Marcianos and I did a bunch of beef steaks this year oh. for all my tomato sauces. I'm a saucer. I like sauces. So. <laughs> Uh, before we get into the process as well, Adrian's also asking, do you freeze your stock to remove the fat layer prior to pressure canning or do you just throw everything in? It depends on the meat. Um, chicken, I like to cook first and get all the, the white stuff off, I guess would be the word for it. Uh, I like to cook my chicken first before I pressure can it. Uh, with roast beef, I like to just throw it in and keep going with a raw pack. Um, with sausages and things like that, I also raw pack those. Um, for hamburger, I like to have it pre-cooked and take as much fat out as I can because there still will be some. You only par-cook your hamburger when you do it pressure canning. You don't cook it all the way, so it's still quite soft. There could be a lot of fat still in the meat. Um, and then when you put the broth in, you will have a layer of fat at the top, um, just like my taco meat here. I don't know if anyone can see this. There's fat layer at the top there. Nice. Yeah. So that's taco beef, which is really yummy. <laughs> Instant taco salad, instant instant tacos. Just open it up and fry it up and get ready to go. So that's the other thing. It's like creating your own fast food. You just come home, open a couple of jars, drop it in the pot or the pan, and you're eating within five, ten minutes. So awesome. So, so is there really anything that you wouldn't can? Like I, I'm just I don't know what I'm even kind of getting. Uh, there, that but... is your grains. So your rice, your wheat, your oatmeal, any of the grain foods out there, they do not can. They don't can at all. Um, they just but turn the bush. Like, they're like gone. Meats and vegetables <laughs> and that kind of stuff. Basically, uh, it's beets, unlimited, more or less. Or basically unlimited on the vegetable side. There's a couple that kind of go super mushy, like okra. I have heard that doesn't go very well. Depends on the recipe, though. Like some people have a recipe that keeps it crispy and good for them. Um, peppers and frozen foods. Like I do a lot of frozen vegetables just for instant canning. I call it. I just buy bags of frozen vegetables because they're at the peak of when they were frozen and put them right in the jar, add my hot water, put them in the pressure canner and instant mixed vegetables. So okay. it's uh, pretty fast I canning, I guess would be the word for it. You're just filling your jars and putting the lids on kind of thing. Um, there is a process to it, of course, but that's with anything that you're doing for preserving food, but there is faster ways to process and put the food away real quick if you want to, so. Awesome. Uh, do you ever, uh, were you listening a couple episodes ago when I talked about dry canning the wheat? Yes. Okay. Is that uh, kind of a thing for you or is that a bad thing? That, or is that... Is, that is a rebel canner thing. That is uh, any kind of dry canning in your oven, what they call dry canning or hot canning. Um, that's kind of a rebel thing to do. These jars are meant to be in water for when they're heated up to that temperature. So if you're putting them into the oven at 250, for instance, 250 Fahrenheit, those jars, there could be problems with the air inside compared to the air outside the jar, and that causes a crack in your jar. Micro cracks could happen, and so you have this jar that could go on your shelf, and you could 
you know, accidentally just bump it against something later and it'll shatter and all your stuff is mixed with broken glass now. So um, that's the biggest thing that could happen with that. The other thing is, why are you needing to do this? Like, <laughs> well, kind of we like... had a problem with weevils and we were told to give that a try one time to get rid of the weevil aspect. You either freeze stuff or, or heat stuff. And then mm -hmm. that's what we were trying. So that's why I asked you because you're the expert, you see. So. Oh. <laughs> and Adrian also asked what kind of things I the really oven like can. to freeze. Like I'll freeze my flour. Yeah. And then I'll put it into a jar and I'll air seal it with the food saver yeah. and suck all the air out, make sure there's an O2 absorber in there on top of that, just to get the stuff I didn't get out. And uh, that can be sealed away. And that's a five-year-old jar of flour now. So depends on uh, what you're up to when it comes to grains, like rice and stuff like that. You have your Mylar bags with your O2 and put them in the bucket and away you go to seal them up. There's no real reason to be jarring grains when you can put them in a mylar in a bucket and it's much more facilitating that bucket can last for another six or eight months once it's open kind of a thing you know like your regular flower for six to eight months once the bag is open same kind of a thing with grains there's no real need to dry can them when you can preserve them better a different way that won't hurt them or take away the nutritional value of the food either because when you heat things up you can hurt the bioproteins within it so See, I always wanted to be a rebel, but I didn't think I was going to do it that way. But <laughs> anyway, <laughs> awesome. Uh, yeah, okay, that that's cool. That's actually that's good to know. Um, so that, that, that's what I was going to ask you there. Oh, broken cans. So, like, if you're pressure canning something and you have it in the All American canner and you're doing your thing, and mm -hmm. um, how do you like? If you have a broken can on the inside of the canner, like because uh, there's a microscopic crack in the glass or something, do you just like kind of trash the whole thing, or just like kind of pick out whatever is uh, remaining, or do you yeah, have a pro if, protocol? If if it came out and had a crack along the side and hadn't busted it, because usually what happens if it's going to crack, it's going to bust and it's going to get stuff all over the inside of your can or in your other jars. It's the pressure in there is just to the point where if there is a crack, it's going to go. It's just not going to crackle pretty like a window pane. Yeah. <laughs> it's going to go. It makes a mess. It's a heck of a mess. I had a chicken one go on me once and chicken <laughs> inside your canner i had to wash the other jars off and that kind of thing and then of course get the glass out of my canner which was a little bit more dicey but uh nothing but rinsing and a scrub pad for that so just make sure i don't have glass embedded in my canner so awesome it's you fun. mentioned <laughs> you mentioned pulling the uh the arrow to the the jar just uh on a regular basis just to to preserve the flower long term is that what they mm -hmm. refer to as retort canning or is that something different Retort is more like the actual tin canning. It's like a really high, high heat. It's it's like when you're doing like chicken noodle soup, for instance, like what Campbell's done is retort. So uh, it's a different level of canning. It's a fast, hot, quick heat kind of a thing to can it and seal it real quickly. And that's usually done on a commercial level. Um, retorting can be done in like a food saver bag. Like, you know, those ones where people put them in bags and they put them in like a souet. Not sous vide, that's the wrong word for it. Uh, sous vide. Like sous vide. Yeah, that kind of a thing. That's technically retort, but it's more like when you see those tuna packages in foil at the grocery store. You know what I mean? Like it's it's a little different. It's a little more commercial is, is, is the word for it. So not really a home at home thing or okay. a sustainable thing, I should say. Cool. Uh, Adrian's also asking uh, if you store your jars with the lids or without. I'm assuming that's on the shelf, like unused. Yes, all of my jars. This one was washed. This one had potatoes in it, just like this guy here. I'm showing my potatoes in the jars. <laughs> and then I washed the jar. I put a brand new lid. I put the nice ring back on it and it's ready to go for next time I use it. So I do a hot water rinse and then this jar is ready to go with its lid and that's how it gets stored. So I can stack them at least too high and squish them into the cupboard a little bit and they're stashed away and they're ready to go for next time rather than having dust dirt spiders you name it getting into your jars in the pantry area um i seal them up right away myself that's just something my family's always done i'm not sure if that's the way to do it but that's just how i've always done it so i have my lids my jars my rings right there ready to go for when i'm ready to go so Oh, that's awesome. Actually, it's equivalent of doing your, your brass prep ahead of time. So the brass is ready yeah. to use. But yeah, You're you got prepping the... for prepping. <laughs> yeah, there you go. That's awesome. Um, she also asked, what kind of pressure canner would you recommend as a preferred brand? Oh, the All-American. Um, that whole series is wonderful. It's easy to use. It doesn't have a rubber seal like the Nesco ones do. Um, so those rubber seals do go after a while and they get a little 
in my opinion, they get a little dicey. <laughs> Uh, just because they do have a moving part that depends on you to get it in the right place at the right right time. You know what I mean? Like it's uh, it's hard to describe. But the All American has a fully milled seal that's just sealed with a little bit of oil. So it's metal on metal. Yeah. Um, and, it, and it has, it's quite industrial actually. When I got my first one, I was quite impressed. <laughs> I was like, this is a piece of hardware. And I do have her here with me. Uh, this is the lid. It's milled aluminum, and it's heavy. This lid alone is probably four pounds. Yeah, I think we have the same uh, same model, actually. Yeah. So this was my first one. This is the 921, so I can double stack two pints in it, or I can put in seven quarts in there, or seven of the 750 mil jars. So, or, or three-quarter quarts, I guess would be the word for it. But she's pretty industrial. She's a... Uh... I don't know if you can hear that. Oh, <laughs> she's yeah. She's pretty... Uh... Mm -hmm. She's pretty thick. <laughs> so I have the 921 and the 915 in my collection. <laughs> and they are collector items, honestly. This thing will outlive me. Uh, they are a little expensive. They're close to about 550 580 depending on where you find it. If you can find one secondhand on Facebook Marketplace or something like that, snag it. Uh, I did buy my second one brand new just because I felt like I wanted something I could rely on. And my first one was a 500 and my second one was like 580. So yeah, they're a little expensive, but uh, to me, this, these are going to outlive me and I can pass them down to my nieces or nephews, depending on who takes over the canning. <laughs> so the man, did, we, did we ever score? We got ours for 80 bucks. That was amazing. Oh, that's wonderful. Yeah. The thing is people don't know what they have sometimes. They're just like, oh yeah, I got this for my mom and she gave it to me and now I'm selling it on Facebook and I'm like, okay, I'll take that. <laughs> Yeah, no, we just, it was a garage sale, I think, for us, or uh, it was Kijiji or something. We just saw, saw it locally, mm -hmm. and it was like, oh, okay, that's, that's awesome. Yeah. Um, Freya does ask, uh, what about pie fillies leaking, I guess, out the side of the jar? Uh, seems to happen all the time when we do those. That is basically two things. It could be you filled it just a little bit too high. I do an inch and a half head space, which is the space at the top of the jar that you leave open for your air to sit in there and to help seal it. Or your pressure has come off too fast. And usually with pie fillings, they are water bath though. So there is no real pressure to play with there on the on the pie fillings usually. So it's all to do with the headspace when it comes to those usually, especially with the clear gel that's in the process for your thickener that's in your thickener agent that's in there sometimes. Depends on the recipe. Um, you can, it does get a little bit bigger. Like my pie started with an inch and a half headspace and then it ended at a, an inch so it grew about half an inch on me so if yeah. it had grown any more it would have started leaking out a little bit so these are my cherries from this year and i guess Pretty if beautiful. it's gonna leak through the seal i guess is that gonna affect the storage life then so it can if you have something that oozed a little bit and it's still sealed like i can hold this by the lid um and it's still sealed i would i do have this one labeled as a one-year-old so I'm going to eat this before the one year. If this one had been leaked, I guess would be the word for it. The unleaked ones, yeah. Once again, I'm doing my two to three year rotation anyways. And I'll be making pies for Christmas out of the ones that kind of oozed kind of thing during the season. So it's just common, not, so, not common sense, but it's just like this is what your process is. So if you do have a leaky one that leaked a little bit and held off a little bit, you kind of want to keep an eye on that one and use that one first, for instance, compared to the ones that didn't leak and didn't have any issue with the seal. So, hmm. uh, <laughs> Bane, good question or good uh, commentary. He goes, I've seen a few canning uh, over the fire videos. Uh, you can. I guess depending on the canner. I guess some canners don't do open flame temps. Um, I guess the flame temps would be a little higher than than, <laughs> than what you'd want to can at. <laughs> uh, it comes down to most people are doing it on open flame. It comes down to especially with the old American, there is a weight that goes on it that jiggles. It's a little weight that sits on here and it jiggles a little bit when it's up at the pressure. So if it's at 15 pounds pressure and I've got a 15 pound weight on there, it's going to jiggle at the 15 pounds. Now, if it's jiggling more than four times in a minute, I'm going to take it off the fire a little bit more. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like I just turn down the temperature on my gas stove a little bit more. Same thing when you're on a, on a flame fire. You can have it jiggle the whole time and you're still there. It's releasing the pressure at that 15 mark, but do keep an eye on it a little closer. Otherwise, you're going to have to move it off the fire a little bit, move some coals over, 
rearrange your coals and put her back on again kind of a thing and keep keep the jiggle going but you can't stop your jiggle when you're pressure canning or you have to start all over again and it's sometimes 90 minutes for a chicken for instance and if sometime during that process you drop lower than your 15 or 10 pounds depending on your altitude you have to start that 90 minutes over again well i'd be a little worried about melting the plastic handles off the uh the the, the, the ceiling part of the uh, the lids too right like, oh, well, that's, there... that's what's good about the all american is the lid at the top is fire safe up to 500 degrees and there oh, is nothing good. plastic anywhere close to the bottom of it hmm. so i could i feel confident i could put her on a on a, on a fireplace and she'd be good to go mm, so that's good yeah, i was just thinking the handles for uh, sealing the top part but that's about it yeah mm -hmm. Oh, uh, okay. Uh, I'd like a fisherman, you know, sharing their good favorite fishing holes. Um, are you willing to share any <laughs> sources for uh, for finding lids and or supply lines or places to find uh, various canning uh, supplies? You can. That's hard. I got dollar like a Dollarama recently. I found some regular lids there that were going for two fifty for the box, and the usual these days is four ninety nine a box. So I loaded up. <laughs> yeah. I got thirty boxes at two fifty. <laughs> Um, but yeah, it's out there for Dollarama in here in Canada. I believe Canadian Tire. There's Uline uh, canning lids. I haven't used them yet myself, but they're they apparently they sell them in bulk, and a lot of other friends of mine have had really good work with them with the Uline products. And then there's just the ball lids and that kind of thing in the states. Um, check your dollar stores. Check your hardware stores. Check these places like feed feed stores and stuff like that because sometimes they have canning supplies and they're not hit as usual as the grocery stores are or your local canadian tire or walmart would be so and you can always ask your walmart when you're getting the supplies in and get there that day kind of a thing so it does a little more work to find the lids um in the past year there was a couple of times where i went a month and a half before i found lids again and then i only found like two boxes and I snagged them and <laughs> brought them home. <laughs> and then recently you can find, you can go on the website, especially Canadian Tire. They've got 635 wide mouth lids and cam loops right now for some reason. <laughs> but there's like none in my valley. There's none in my friend's valley down in the lower mainland. And yet cam loops has 635 boxes of wide mouth lids for some reason. So yeah, I'm shipping those to myself now. So it's just mailed to me now. I think they instead of ten boxes, they got ten pallets or something. I don't know what happened there, um, but yeah, I'm not sure what went on there. But uh, be very careful online, especially Amazon. There's people selling Ball and Bernardin lids, and they are not Ball and Bernardin when they show up. They are Chinese specials, and they are crap. They are not worth your time and energy. So Lost unless fish. it actually has the Bernardin stamp right on the lid, I would not use it honestly here in Canada. Yeah, especially if uh, you're canning something expensive, you don't want to lose it just for the sake of a cheap lid. So yep. uh, rings, obviously, you can keep using rings until they just basically are no good anymore, or rusted out, or how how often do you use the rings? Rings, you can just keep re using. I do like to clean and dry mine after they've been in the canner, and just to keep the rust away as long as possible. And then I just hang them on a string in my pantry, and that's where they hang temporarily. But yeah. Okay. Cool. So basically, the, the main the main wear item is the ring or the the lids. But the lid. um, yeah, for myself, like we found all American parts at Home Hardware. But uh, by the same token, if you do get a used all American somewhere at a garage sale and you're missing parts after you've watched your YouTube videos and figure out what parts you need, mm -hmm. um, you can call All American and they'll actually send them across the border as well. That's what mm -hmm. we found. So we and have good good to go company, good to go co company in uh, the Kelowna Valley. There has. All, Amer all American available also. They're like a, a kind of semi-prepper page also. Cool. I've uh, gotten an extra weight from them before. <laughs> yeah, well, the weight makes a difference depending on what altitude you're at too, right? Mm -hmm. uh, Jeff, do you want to cover off some of Scott's questions? Sure. So uh, I think we kind of covered this, but maybe if we'll just uh, do a quick rehash. So he says, can you reuse commercial jars? Um, he basically... Uh, says, I know past the jars fit the regular Renardin lids, or is the embossing design or the glass somewhat different? I worry yes. that the thinner glass <laughs> with the measurement marks may be a weak point. So I actually brought an example. This is an Atlas Mason. This is your typical classical spaghetti jar. And Atlas Mason, it does fit a regular, um, regular size lid. 
this would be great for water bath canning after the fact. I wouldn't use it for pressure canning again because it is a thinner type jar. But she is a mason jar. She'd be great for your water bath canning. She'd be great for drying, you know, you put your pasta in there and air seal it kind of a thing. And you'd be good to go. But these are great little jars. I've, I buy this spaghetti sauce just to get the jars, honestly. So it's uh but you would but you wouldn't pressure with them you just do the the bath i i don't think i would i don't want to risk it i can feel the difference in the glass between mm -hmm. my regular mason and what this one feels like if i put my fingers in and touch the inside edge it's definitely a little bit thinner so okay. i would use it for my pie fillings my jams my water bath canning i'm not sure i would put that in my pressure canner honestly i don't think i would trust it especially since it's been through a commercial process and i don't know if there's micro <laughs> Micro problems, micro yeah. cracks in it or not. So I yep. don't want to smash my meat all over my canner again. So I'll use a proper yep. jar for the for the pressure canning. But water bath canning, this would be fine. Yeah. Yep. As a general okay, rule, yeah. does it have to have threads all the way around it, or is it those jars with the partial threads uh, no good? Or how does that work exactly? I like full threads, which this one is. You can tell by the lid. It's got a nice thick lid to it. You can tell it comes down. It has the same rings as everything else. And I've put my rings on it with the regular jars when I've processed it and put away into storage. So I like having a full ring edge to it just to hold it down. Because you want to hold that lid down, especially in water bath canning. You don't want the water to get in. So you want a little bit of air to get out through that, through that rubber seal. But you don't want water to get in. So you want to make sure that you actually have a proper screw down on it, basically. Is that okay. Mason Mason uh, label on the on the glass? Is that kind of like an it's industry right standard? on the glass? Yep, you can see it right on the glass. It'll say Mason, and some other spaghetti jars actually are like the glass is done by Bernardin, for instance, here in Canada, that kind of a thing. So you can investigate what the glass jar says on it. Um, Mason, Bernardin, Ball, those kind of things. They do make commercial jars for commercial companies, so you can find those jars that way, depending on the sauce and what's in there. Okay, uh, and um, actually, it's funny, one of the uh, people in the, the comment section asked the question that I was going to ask because I uh, am in love with my Instant Pot, and so their question was, any success pressure canning with an Instant Pot? I honestly wouldn't, um, okay. just because the pressure, yes, it is a pressure cooker. It is meant to pressurize and that kind of thing, but it does it in a slightly different way. There isn't enough release within the process from what I've read, um, I would get a proper pressure canner that can get to the right pressure pound per square inch kind of a thing. When my case, it's like 15 pounds per square inch in my pressure mm -hmm. canner. So that's pretty severe. Your typical Instapot gets to like five or 10. It's okay. not gonna get up there. And you have to have a certain amount of water in there and that kind of thing. There's people that do it. Once again, Rebel canners are out there. They're doing it. <laughs> um there is actual electric pressure canners now that you can get i think it's from actual ball themselves is making the electric pressure canner now that you can set your dials and like walk away which to me blows my mind i'm not sure if i could trust it uh but i like to be part of the process and make sure i'm right there with my pressure at the right pressure the whole time but uh they are out there but the instapots they're great for your roast beef and your chicken go ahead and cook i just would not trust pressure canning meat inside there that's for sure no, and, and actually, I never thought of that, that that makes sense that you can't, you can't control the pressure like on a, like mm -hmm. you say on yours without the ball, well, the, the pressure jiggle, as yeah. it gets a bit more than what you need and the instant pot doesn't do that. It's a, it's all a manual release. So yeah, the pressure would just continue to build or, and there's mm -hmm. no way to read the pressure. There's no gauges. There's no, so yeah, yeah I, I, I never thought of that. It's good points. So another yeah. question Scott had was about uh, single use snap lids. And he says, what about them makes them single use? And in a resource depleted situation, what would we do to reuse them if absolutely necessary? Are the glass lids and rubber rings even available commercially anymore? The, you can get plastic lids with rubber rings, which is the, uh, like the Harvest Guard and the Tattlers. Uh, those are the forever lids, as they, as they say. You can keep using them forever, which they say is about 20 or 21 uses before that rubber actually starts to go, and you'd have to get new rubber again anyways. Uh, I do have some. I just haven't played with them yet. Um, I purchased them this year to try them out, and I just haven't quite got to them yet. <laughs> but your average snap lid, I'm just showing an example right now, your average everyday snap lid with the rubber attached to the back, mm -hmm. uh, it is pretty basic like it snaps, <laughs> it snaps for your section when it comes out. 
If I use this for pressure canning, I took it off very carefully without denting this edge at all, which is really hard to do, by the way. It's really on there. It's <laughs> it's worse than a beer bottle. Let's put it that way. Um, yeah. It's really on there. So taking that off safely without wrecking that rubber that's underneath there, pulling it apart basically is what you're doing because it's bonded to the glass. Uh, so you're pulling it right apart. I would maybe use this for like pickles for water can for water bath canning that would be going in my fridge right away, not something that would be going on my cupboard right away. Or I would use it for dry goods for sealing up my pasta or my flour again, that kind of a thing. So I don't know. I'm 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 on the, I'm on the safe side of things. I don't really rebel that much. <laughs> There's people that have done it and they're like, oh, it's sealed. It's great. It's fine. And I'm just like, okay, that's that's your table. That's not my table. So. I'd rather be on the safe side of that. That's fair enough. Yeah. Uh, Josh does have a question here. Uh, do you leave the rings on the jars after sealing? So I guess uh, do you remove the, the rings afterwards to reuse them on the next batch? Yes. There is a couple of really good reasons why. You can produce a false seal on your jar. So if your ring is still on there, first of all, when it comes out of the canner, especially pressure canning, that ring will be very loose. That lid is sucked on there tighter than you could ever push down. <laughs> So that ring's going to be a little loose to start with. So I take my ring right off, wash them up, hot soap and water. They go on the shelf. Uh, having that ring still on there can produce a false seal. So if that seal, if that if you go and tighten that ring back down and you put it on the shelf, say for some reason your seal did go, you've now got air in there. You've got all kinds of bacteria, your yeast, everything that's in the air, your mold is now growing on your food in there and you've sealed it in. That bacteria can grow within your food that's inside and you wouldn't see it until you open up that jar and hopefully you would smell a difference when you open that jar but some people have just put into a stew and cooked it up and then everyone gets food poisoning so it's it's a little nasty so you want to be able i can hold my jars up by the lid i can hold them right up they're sealed on there i know they're sealed i can check them i can go look at them i can check them with my hand really quick and just feel the edge of them really quick in the pantry when i'm in there i'm like oh i'll check that batch i did a month ago ding 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 ding. yep they're all tight and go on with my way so and the other thing is that with that false seal you don't really the ring can actually seize on there so say you did have some oozing from something in there and you didn't realize it and that's that ring is on there and it's now become one with the lid and the jar <laughs> And there's no way of getting that food out unless you break the jar. There's just no way to get that lid off, that ring off of there. And now you've basically <laughs> sealed it away forever. It's not coming back. So I've had a ring stuck on before when I was a kid. And I was like, got my mom. She's like, I can't get this off. My dad couldn't get it off. And she's like, well, we're just going to have to toss this one, I guess. Because <laughs> we no. just could not get it off. It was almost, it was impossible. We even boiled it to try and get it off. And it wasn't coming off. Not even so, channel locks or anything, eh? No. It oh was wow! <laughs> it's really yeah. on there. Yeah, because there was there was a question in the live chat there again from uh, DM Dave or Davey, sorry, asking uh, what's the best way to open a stubborn jar of hot bath pickles? You can hot bath it again. Get it back in the water in the hot water. Especially put it in my case. I have the lid off, so I would if I couldn't get this off, I just use my can opener. Just it's gone, kind of a thing. But getting that ring off again. You can hot bath it just to expand it again real quick because the ring will heat up before the jar will. And you can try and sweep it that way or just run underneath hot water to try and get it off. Um, but it shouldn't be there to start with. Um, and if it is, uh, good luck. <laughs> <laughs> Honestly, if I take, I take the, the back end of a knife and mm -hmm. basically put, it, put it the, the highest thread and the actual lid and just kind of pry sideways and lifts up the lid just tiny enough to break the seal. It seems to work for most of them. But Yeah. Right. I just use a regular like hook can opener and just done. done. It's uh, open. Adrian has another question. Uh, what do you feel is the best way to store your finished canned goods? I guess uh, lids up or lids sideways. Like, you know, is there a preferred method? Dry, I cold? just leave them lids up. I don't put anything upside down. None of my family has ever put things upside down, even her jams and her jellies and everything else. We don't put things upside down. I don't know where that is from. I honestly don't. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I see it in the occasional YouTube video for canning. I'm like, why is she putting it upside down? There's no reason. <laughs> so um, I'll take my rings off as soon as it's cooled down enough. So first of all, you're taking it out of the canner. You're putting it on your countertop. It's going to sit there for the next... 16 24 hours and cool down it takes a long time to cool down from a pressure canner i had chicken still boiling in the jar four hours later 
So you'll see the bubbles of boiling from the pressure. Just the pressure creates this boiling effect within the jar. So then I'll take my lids off. The next day when they're nice and cooled down, they go into the sink. I get hot soapy water. Just give them a good rinse under the hot soapy water. They go on that. They get dried. They get labeled at that point on the top part for the date of the batch. Just in case I have a batch that goes bad. Say I open up when it's really bad. I'm going to check the rest of that batch and see what's going on. And if something has gone on, then I can remove that whole batch. So I don't want to play Russian roulette with my food. <laughs> uh, it's like, is this the one from that batch or not? Let's open this up and see. Yeah. So label everything with the date that you made it, of course, and what's inside. Because sometimes chili looks a lot like hamburger and hamburger looks a lot like beans. It's really weird when it's in the jar for a while. You start looking at it sideways and you're just like, oh, I'm not sure what that is. So put a label on it. Your Sharpie on your lid, for instance. I got chili from 2020 <laughs> here. And it's just you want to label it and make sure it's put away so it's all nice and dry it goes down in my lower pantry in my basement for me nice and cool and dark no sunshine on these jars you want them in the dark you want them just like mushrooms in the dark just sitting there doing their thing and staying cool and calm down in the dark so hmm. cool uh, phil does ask a question here i'm not sure if what he's 100 what he means but uh can brushes cause micro abrasions in a jar I, I guess like if you're brushing the inside of it or scrubbing the inside of it yes and no there's i know with all the little canning kits that people get there's a little plastic stick for debubbling i love that little plastic stick because if you're using a metal knife you could be scraping the inside of your jar for instance and that could ah. cause a micro abrasion i use soft scrubbies when i use my jars there's no reason to put an sos pad in a canning jar um, or anything like that, like a really heavy scrubby should not be in there. It should all be like a plastic scrubby or a wet cloth, for instance. I just use a cloth or a plastic scrubby. I do not want to create any abrasions within my jars on the outside of my jar or the inside of my jars. Awesome. Uh, Freya does mention that we probably need a canning series of videos at this point. <laughs> but we'll probably get, probably get to that soon enough. Um, we'll talk to talk about Carmen's uh, uh, website and stuff later on here. Uh, Adrian one also asked, do you leave your meat canned goods in the canner overnight to cool or let the pressure go down or do you wait until just the, the pressure has been released? So this is important, especially with the All Americans or any pressure canner actually, is you let her cool down. So say you've done your 90 minutes, your 90 minutes is up, turn off the heat. Do not move the canner off the heat. Just turn off the heat, leave her there. Let her sit for at least a half an hour. You want things to start coming down. You'll see your pressure gauge will start falling. Everything will slowly come down. Then I'll move her completely, especially if I have like, for me, it's the it's the iron stove, so it's still hot underneath. I want to move her just to the side. There's a little cooler. So I'll move her to where it's cooler, and I'm still watching that gauge. She's still at 5 pounds or 10 pounds still from a 15-pound high. For me, where my altitude is, I'm quite high up, so I would do 50 pound, 15 pounds for most of my guys. So I'm watching it come down. As soon as she gets down to zero, I start counting an extra half an hour at that point because I want it to stay at zero for at least a half an hour before I pull my weight a little bit and I'll pull my weight off. If she starts hissing excessively, I'll drop it right back down. I don't want that pressure to be released too quickly. It can pull fluid. It can pull things from the jars inside, having that pressure release, just like, like deep sea divers type of thing. The pressure gets released too quickly. You just, right? It closes right up on you. So if it's just a small little hiss, I'll take the weight off. It'll be a bit shh, and then like there's no steam there. It's now equalized. I'll wait another five minutes for that full equalization to happen between the two, two systems. Then I'll take crank her off, take the lid off and take her out and put her on the countertop. And then I can go to bed because <laughs> it's usually 9 30 or 10 o'clock at night when this is happening <laughs> and I'm waiting for it to finish so I can go to bed. <laughs> but, awesome. Yeah. Leaving um, her in overnight can cause issues with your cans, though. Um, they can stay too hot for too long, and you've over, you kind of overcooked the food and overprocessed it a little bit. Um, and a lot of people say their lids will st will not stick properly sometimes, or they've lost pressure. I like to have it out on the countertop, know what's going on inside of my canner. Maybe a jar is broken during the process, and I didn't hear it break, etc. And never leave your canner alone. I mean, you can go to the washroom and back, but stay inside the room with it. Seems reasonable advice. Uh, Bane mentions uh, old style canning used to uh, cool jars upside down. That internet morphed into an urban legend. <laughs> so, yeah, <laughs> I guess. Um, they kind of used to do that because the seals, they wanted the extra pressure on the seal. 
So the seals have actually improved since then on the jars, on the lids and stuff. So with those with those old school glass lids with the rubber seals, they would turn them upside down. So the extra pressure of the jar and its contents would push on that seal and help seal it. So it's just another process that they did. And now it's not even it's not needed at all anymore, honestly. Not with awesome. the way our lids are now. Awesome. Yeah, we haven't even talked about the whole process yet, but I guess we could probably do that in <laughs> canning preserving part three at this point. Maybe. Uh, yeah, I don't know. It depends if we can convince you to come back. <laughs> so, <laughs> I'll uh, come back. <laughs> oh, that's good. Uh, Jeff, you got any more questions? Uh, I don't know. All right, cool. Uh, well, well, why don't we just call her there? And uh, we've been on for about an hour, so we should uh, probably give the listeners a break. Oh, and it has we can... been. Oh, deeper. Yeah, so we'll <laughs> travel fast. Time flies when you're having fun. Exactly. Some pretty chicken. Uh, some well, pretty chicken there. So that's what cooked chicken looks like in a jar. If you go on the YouTube and you see it on the YouTube at the very end, you'll see what the cooked chicken looks like there. And you can add spices to your meat. Spices are awesome in meat. I add Italian spice to my chicken all the time. Taco spice, um, Montreal steak spice, anything really. So, so would the would the would the pressure then sort of act and kind of make it like sort of a pseudo marinade? Oh yes, yes. My roast beef when it comes out is fantastic. I have to admit to that. I do like just a Montreal steak spice with a little extra garlic in there. And she's beautiful. She's like she's been in the slow cooker for 12 hours and I've marinated her, you know, <laughs> for 12 hours before that. She's beautiful meat when she comes out. It's really soft and fluffy, kind of like a pulled pork roast at that point, but it's it's a nice texture. I like to have it with my mashed potatoes. So how, how much really do you good. have to cook it in advance? Like, like, like how much do you cook? With roast beef, you, you don't. Roast beef, you, you don't? don't. You just put it right in the jar. Yeah. I like to cook really? chicken ahead of time because it doesn't look pretty in the jar and it doesn't, <laughs> I really don't want to eat <laughs> the all the white stuff that's in the jar. Um, but roast beef, you can put in raw pack. You can cook it ahead of time. So say you had leftover roast, for instance. You had half of a roast leftover when you cooked a big roast for Sunday dinner and nobody showed up for some reason. You could can that roast still the leftover can you could do the four jars of roast that it is or whatever it is and you could can that roast and put it away for a while same with turkey dinner and stuff like that like my turkey that i have downstairs is from turkey dinner it's leftover turkey from turkey dinner excellent so yeah Good to i know. prefer cooked meat going into the jar honestly because it looks nicer in the jar and i'll actually want to eat it <laughs> mm -hmm. awesome well i guess so uh, we'll come back to uh, part three i'm sure but uh should we move on to the podcast challenge Sure. Sure. So the pod, your podcast challenge is now that lids are starting to come back into stock and with supply chain issues randomly appearing, maybe now is the time to get some uh, consumables if you're planning to get into the canning business, hobby, whatever you want to do. Mm -hmm. Yes, the jars are coming back and the lids are coming back. I like my local Canadian Tire had I'm going to say about seven pallets of jars going on there. It was crazy. It was beautiful. It was nice to see because there was nothing for months. <laughs> yeah, awesome. It definitely is hit and miss, though, for sure, because ours was out for the longest time. Then finally, they just got like one box of lids, and that was it. Uh, it, was, it was insane. Well, uh, as far as upcoming events, deal of the week, I didn't really have much this week, uh, so I kind of we're gonna skip those for now. But uh, shout outs, I just want to give a quick shout out to listener Darren uh, once again. Uh, clacking off the episode uh, challenges. Uh, he did episode 12 uh, podcast challenge, which was uh, walking into five kilometers or better for five days straight. So we're going nice. to call him the walking man now. So he's uh, he's carrying on with that. So good for him. Uh, awesome. Awesome job, Darren. Uh, email and iTunes okay. reviews. So we had one from listener Denny. And uh, he said, hey, guys, just wanted to let you know on your episode, he doesn't say which one, but uh, we've probably talked about a few times that uh, we talked about cooking when the power goes out and we mentioned gas stoves. Uh, he says, I grew up with gas stoves. Folks and grandparents had one. So when we bought our house, I was thrilled to see we had a gas stove. Power goes out. You turn the gas on, light it with a match. Uh, the issue is that ours doesn't do that. Uh, some gas stoves, especially the newer ones. Um, I just stuck that word in there, newer ones, because that seems to be the ones are being made with a safety valve on them. So when you have no power for the electronic ignition, uh, the gas won't allow you to just light it. Mm -hmm. right. uh, well, thanks for that, Denny. Uh, so actually, when I when I listened to that one, he actually had me worried because I just put the gas stovetop in here and I was <laughs> kind of freaking out. I was like, no. So I turned off the breaker and luckily ours still works. Uh, 
so I think because ours is just like a range top and with the, like a, a downdraft fan, it doesn't actually have the oven part to it. That might be the difference in the fact that maybe the, the cutoff is more for the oven, the gas oven. Um, so yeah, at least my, my range top works. But again, there is actually a fix. I went on YouTube and took a look at this. Uh, so I put a YouTube video link in there that basically will show you how to use a 12 volt battery and an inverter to make sure you got just enough power going to the oven to make sure that the safety valve is bypassed, which is good. So in case of power okay. you just needed a car, uh, like a small 12 volt and you're fine. Nice. I mean, I, I would recommend I finding the that. valve and, and just you're putting a line around the valve, but then Alan would have a conniption and talk about carbon monoxide and gas and stuff. So <laughs> I'm going to have to look into that because I just got a new gas stove myself. So I'm going to have to look into it now. Great. Yeah, <laughs> it's, it's actually very interesting. I, I can understand their point if they had a pilot light and, you know, I don't know mm. if they do pilot lights anymore, but if they had a pilot light in the oven part and maybe that was an issue or something, but mm. for just a range top, it seems to be not an issue. So that's good. That's good. Yeah. That's good. Mm -hmm. So with that, I guess we'll bring episode 128 of the Canadian Purple Podcast to an end. You can find the podcast on iTunes, Podbean, Spotify, or your favorite podcast app. Uh, please help us out and submit an interview. It helps other people find us. And we record these shows live on Facebook and YouTube. Shockingly, we're still here. We haven't been kicked <laughs> off yet. Uh, if you want an early peek at the shows, please subscribe to the YouTube channel, uh, Canadian Pepper Podcast, and click the notifications tab. That gives you an alert when we're going live. Uh, you can contact us at feedback at prepperpodcast.ca. And I'm Carmen again, and my email is microsteading at gmail.com because that's what I'm doing. I'm in suburbia and I'm microsteading here. So I'd love to connect with others. So give me a, give me a note. Awesome. Uh, you can reach Ian directly by emailing me at the Island Retreat at gmail.com and on Gab and Odyssey at the Island Retreat. Uh, you can also find me on Canadian Patriot Podcast, which is on iTunes and YouTube, and the Discord group called Canadian Patriot Podcast. Email us if you want an invite. Uh, there you can find us discussing why government waste and society has me talking about food preservation with enthusiasm. Anyway, thanks for joining us. Till next time, be prepared, stay safe, and keep learning. Exactly. <laughs>